We're going to talk about a star called Eta Carinae. Eta Carinae? Yes. Is that how it's pronounced? Oh, that's how I pronounce it. <laughs> it is a star. I mean, so the reason why it's called Eta is because it's in this stellar classification scheme where you go through a constellation and you name the stars through the Greek alphabet. And so Eta, letter of the Greek alphabet. And Carinae, because it's in the constellation of Carina. This is the coolest star in the sky by a long way. You don't mean cool in the astronomer term? No, I mean cool in the amazing sense. Yes, it is a truly astounding object. Plus, there's an outside chance it might kill us all, so it's kind of good to know about. It's a star that's kind of right at the end of its life. There's a possibility it's going to blow up. It's a possibility it's already blown up, given that it's 7,500 light years away. There's an outside possibility that when it blows up, it'll create one of these gamma ray bursts. There's an even more outside possibility that that gamma ray burst will be pointed directly at the Earth. And when that gamma ray burst hits the atmosphere, it will fry. That's a popular story. And in fact, if you hunt around the internet, you'll find that, that Eta Carina is going to kill us all. But actually, it's not. And so for various reasons. Firstly, almost certainly because of the nature of the object, when this thing explodes, it's not going to produce a gamma ray burst. And as you'll see from the geometry of it, we're pretty sure that if there is a gamma ray burst, it won't be directed in our direction anyway. So no, it's not going to kill us. It will be pretty spectacular. If it goes supernova, then it will be as bright as the full moon when it goes for you know a year or so afterwards. So actually, it will be a pretty spectacular sight in the sky when it goes, but it's really not going to kill us. The gun's probably not loaded, and even if the gun is loaded, it's not pointed at exactly us. Exactly so. So we're not looking down the barrel. We'll be fine. We don't know a huge amount about this star. It's actually quite hard to figure out exactly what's going on. And so observationally, it's hard to see what's going on. Theoretically, we really don't understand these very last stages of a star's life particularly well. So the short answer is, yes, it could go off tomorrow, or it could go off in 50,000 years' time and we really don't know which. So this is what this thing looks like. So it really is a pretty spectacular looking object when you point the Hubble Space Telescope at it. And the reasons for this weird structure will come through in a second, but the stars come in somewhere down in the middle there. It's a slightly weird star because actually it's very variable. And so it was when it was first documented in the 18th century, um, it was sort of a, a naked eye object. Then in the 19th century, very briefly, it became incredibly bright. It became the second brightest star in the sky for a little while, second only to Sirius. Um, and then it faded out of, uh, out of uh, naked eye sight entirely, faded down again. And so it varies around a lot. So it's clearly there's something pretty dramatic going on. The thing with stars is usually they sit around for millions, billions of years, not doing anything very much. And the fact that this thing is varying on a time scale of years tells you that something pretty dramatic going on in it. All this other stuff you can see, the, the thing you can see around it is called the homunculus nebula because it's supposed to look like a little person. I can't really see it myself, but there we go. And what, I don't know what homunculus is. It means a, sm a small person. All that stuff you see around it, this homunculus nebula, is actually associated with this massive brightening that happened in about 1840. What's thought that happened is the star almost exploded at that point. It almost went supernova. And in the process, so there's a very massive star in the middle there. It weighs about 120 times the mass of the sun. And in about 1840, it threw, threw off about 20 or 30 times the mass of the sun. So a good fraction of its total mass got thrown out into space. And what you're seeing there is that debris kind of expanding away from the star. Could easily have exploded entirely at that point, but it looks like it just lost about 30% of its mass at that point. Is this a common occurrence for stars to have a sort of a... a, a and not quite a near-death experience? I think it's the only one we really know about. I mean, it, this, is, it, it's a, it, this is a very massive star. So it's more than 100 times the mass of the sun. They're quite rare. And this is the closest example. It's, about, it's only about 7,500 light years away, which actually you know, sounds a long way. But, uh, but actually, for stars that massive, this is a relatively nearby example of it because they really are very few and far between. What happens next? Does it, does, it, does it get another crack at it, or has it missed its chance to go out in a blaze of glory? Our understanding of these late stages of stellar evolution are really sufficiently poor that we just don't know. Um, probably it will blow up at some point. There's a further complication which we'll come to, which is actually it's not a single star, it's got a companion. So there's another star around it. So the main star is about 100 times the mass of the Sun. There's another little star, which is only about 20 or 30 times the mass of the Sun in orbit around it. And in fact, these two stars, as we'll see, are quite closely interacting, which further complicates our understanding of what's going on. This is a two-dimensional view of this star. Um, and you can kind of infer the three-dimensional shape sort of just by looking at it. But the neat thing that's been recently done is some astronomers have figured out how to turn this two-dimensional picture into a three-dimensional picture, essentially by using the expansion of the, of the lobes. Because this material is all flying out, you can actually measure the speed at which the different bits of it are expanding by looking at the Doppler shift in the light that's being emitted. And so you look at a particular spectral line, something that should be occurring at a particular wavelength, and you see how much it's blue shifted or red shifted to figure out how fast it's moving. And by making some assumptions about how the thing's expanding, you can then turn that speed 
into the third dimension in space. Essentially because the further you are away from the star, the faster things are moving. So if you see something moving very fast, it's probably a long way from the star. If you see things moving more slowly, it's kind of closer to the star. So that sort of gives you that third dimension. And that allows you, with a, some fairly clever analysis, to turn this into a three-dimensional picture of what this thing looks like. These guys have published a paper about this. And so here's their three-dimensional model of what that, ex that expanding pair of blobs looks like. They also produced a 3D CAD model for what they've done. And so that anyone who's got a 3D printer can go out and print their own. So we printed our own star. Go on. We'll see. So here it is. A 3D printed version. So I went to our guys you know, in, in at the University of Nottingham. There's a group who do a thing called additive manufacturing, which is basically figuring out really clever things to do with 3D printers. And although this is not their kind of uh, their main business, they can 3D print anything pretty much. Unlike you know the usual uh, 3D printers, they can actually print in lots of different materials as well. So they actually printed this out for me in titanium. This is a star printed in titanium based on that 3D model of what this exploding star looks like. I have to say this is far beneath their dignity to do this kind of thing, that actually they can do the most amazing stuff. Their ultimate ambition, these guys, is they want to 3D print a mobile phone which works as soon as you take it out of the printer. So that's the kind of level of ambition. So you can see this is really not pushing their technology particularly hard. We try and see if we can orient it kind of the same way as it is in... It's going to be tough because you know what way you're looking at things from. Yeah. It's kind of something like that, I think, from where you are. Okay, so there's that. So the main things you can see are the, those kind of two lobes. Presumably the, the, there's an axis to the star, something to do with its direction of rotation. Probably there was a kind of disk of material around the star which stopped it from expanding in that direction and therefore it expanded sort of towards the poles of the star. These two lobes you can see sticking out are the, the, the results of that explosion kind of out along the poles of the star. But you can see there's a lot of other structure as well. There were these little, there's a little dimple in the end um, and this strange kind of groove channel in the end here and the other thing that they really studied really for the first time are these two bits sticking out to the side which turn out to be might be telling us something rather fundamental about the nature of the explosion and this is the first time they've really been able to see this the sort of three-dimensional structure of these strange wings sticking out to the side they printed out in, in plastic um, and uh, been able to look at it they actually using there's lots of uses for this this actually allows you to study things in a way that they've not been studied before they're also very useful aids for, for example, if you're trying to explain astronomy to blind people, being able to produce three-dimensional models of things and so that they become much more tactile. Um, so they're useful from an educational perspective as well. But actually you can learn things about the structure of something just by being able to look at it really in three dimensions. It's so much more, somehow more real when you have a little three-dimensional model of something rather than just looking at even animated on a computer screen. The other thing that's sort of interesting about this object is it is a binary star. Um, that was actually only discovered about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and the way that the, the easy way that we know it's a binary star is because actually things vary in this thing in a periodic way. Um, every five and a half years, for example, this object produces a sudden burst of X-rays. Um, and so it's been monitored over quite a long period of time and they've monitored a series of these X-ray bursts. And what's happening there is you've got these two massive stars. Um, so one, remember, is about 110 solar masses, something like that. The other is about probably 20 or 30 solar masses. Each of those stars is actually has a, a strong stellar wind, so it's actually throwing particles off, throwing its outer layers off the whole time. And it's on a, they're on a very, the low mass one, lower mass one, is on a very eccentric orbit around the higher mass one. And so they kind of orbit around each other. And, and you've got these winds coming off them, so the wind from one smacks into the wind from the other. And you get this very uh, intense interaction where the winds collide with each other, form shocks, get heated up to very high temperatures and emit X-rays. And obviously when the thing reaches close to its closest approach, the small star approaches the, the bigger star, you get this sudden burst of X-rays because there's this sudden very strong interaction between the two. And what happens is that the, the, the littler star has a lower density but higher speed wind, which kind of clears out a cavity in the bigger, bigger star. So you can see that this is sort of strange little spiral structure appears. But the more interesting thing is that most of the time, the structure looks something like this, that the littler star has kind of cleared out a region of the bigger star. It looks like Pac-Man eating a power pill. So, exactly. And the, but the interesting thing is that how, how wide the Pac-Man's jaw is open here, which is about 120, 130 degrees, and the direction in which this opening is pointing. Because if we go back to this little model for a second, there are these two little lobes sticking out to the sides, and the angle between them is about 130 degrees. And in fact, the direction in which they're pointing is the, exactly the same as the direction of that opening.
If you enjoyed this video, you will almost certainly love Deep Sky Videos, our dedicated astronomy channel where we focus in depth on various astronomical objects and in between show you around some of the world's best telescopes. Check it out, there's a link on the screen and in the video description.